Hi, Sloan's Lake. Steve Rennick, your state pastor for the Church of God here in Colorado. I want to say thank you and congratulations. Congratulations on 130 years and thank you for leading the way. You were first and you're still first and we appreciate you. Uh, we know that what God has started is not complete. It's 130 years since it started, but man, we love what's going on today and we can't wait to see what's gonna happen tomorrow. Go get them, Sloan's Lake. Hey Sloan's Lake, this is Jim Obold. I'm a pastor in Anderson, Indiana, and uh, I'm an executive pastor for Westlake Church of God and also the director of financial planning for Servant Solutions. Uh, and so I've helped uh, Pastor Lee in his transition to Sloan's Lake. So we've grown very close over the last year, but I just wanted to say congratulations on 130 years of your existence and helping people live Christ-centered lives. And I just want you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your pastor. I love the church. I love your pastor. And I just uh, wish you the best and blessings on this expedition series. So take care. Sloan's Lake, congratulations on celebrating 130 years of helping people live Jesus-centered lives from Kyle Yonkman at Meadow Park Church in Columbus, Ohio. Hello, I'm John Fawzer, president of Mid-America Christian University here in Oklahoma City. I wanted to congratulate you, the people of Sloan's Lake, on 130 years of faithful service in the kingdom of God. I don't know if you realize what a faithful example that is to younger generations that are looking for examples of commitment and consecration to the Lord's work. So from the faculty, the staff, the board of trustees here at Mid-America, congratulations Sloan's Lake, we're so thankful to be in service with you in God's kingdom. So we are just a couple weeks away from the end of this series as we've looked back over 13 decades of continuous ministry in Denver, Colorado. And the theme for this series has been twofold. We've been looking back on those elements of our past that we are called to reclaim. Those things are just a part of who we are and we would be foolish to ignore them as we walk the road ahead. But we have also been looking at what God is doing and going to do in the next season. So I've mentioned it a few times, but the very first act of our church's history, in fact, the very first act for the state ministry in the Church of God here in Colorado was an act of generosity, that great amount of donation that was given to bring evangelists here to Denver. But the other side of that is the heart, the intent behind it, because James Pollock gave that money, brought those evangelists here to reach the people God misses most right here in Denver. And so the very strands of our DNA, if you picture that double helix, the two on the outside, are generosity and a heart to reach the people God misses most in our community. That is who we are. And that topic is more relevant than ever. All the way back in 2014, which doesn't seem that long ago, but when you talk about statistics nowadays, it's like every year is a light year ahead. So back in 2014, Pew Survey did a, a search and a survey into the church and found that in America from 10 years ago, we had declined by 30% in overall church attendance. That is the number of people in America that attend some form of a congregation, not even Christian, just, just for some form of congregation. And so that accounts for 114 million adults. But then it gets even scarier as you look at the statistics because that was just the adults in America. When you add in children and youth, that is 156 million Americans who are no longer connected in any way to the body of Jesus Christ through a local congregation. Now, of course, some may be worshiping in private and, and that's you know not accounted for in this, but just looking at these numbers, we have a task ahead of us. See, if we are going to live Jesus-centered lives, I believe our hearts have to break for what breaks God's heart. And we live in a new era. You know, in the 1950s to the 1990s, there was some sort of cultural expectation that you would know God, that you would go to a church. It was your civic duty. It was the American thing to do. But now we are in a brand new era where these are not only not the expectations on the average person, 
It's almost exactly the opposite. The cultural norm is not to believe in a God or to, to believe in whatever you want to believe in, to say, sure, there might be a God, but, but that's just up to you to figure that out for yourself. And as a part of this, churches around our country, especially older established churches, are declining and closing their doors at alarming rates. I listened to a couple different podcasts uh, throughout the week, and two of them are by a guy named Dr. Tom Rayner. He leads Lifeway Christian Resources, and, and they do these big surveys that sweep mostly through the Baptist world, but also through the out, out the Church of God. That's odd. <laughs> and one of the things that they have come up with, and they've talked about, is that for every church we are planting in the church planting movement, there is at least one church that is closing their doors that are existing. And so if we are looking at the field, if we are saying, you know, are we making progress in our world, we're basically at a zero-sum game. And so they have this podcast, these teachings they do called Revitalize and Replant. It's about taking older congregations and helping them see a new day. And one of the things that was said on that podcast this week really stood out to me. And so I want to share it with you. The guest on the podcast said, revitalizing older churches is spiritual warfare. Revitalizing older churches is spiritual warfare. The enemy of our souls does not want churches reclaiming what God has for them in a new day. The enemy of our souls is much more invested in simply letting older churches drift into obscurity because revitalizing means a new day and a new day means a renewed commitment to making disciples of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know this, but we are technically an older church. At 130 years old, we, as John Fossard said, as, as Steve, our state pastor said, we, we were here from the beginning, but we're walking into a new day. And if we're going to continue to reach the people God misses most, we have to continue to focus our hearts on what it looks like to snatch people from the very gates of hell. We have to change the questions that are on our hearts, not, do I like this? Is this something that's pleasing to me? But what is it going to take to reach the next generation? And even more so than that, what is it going to take to make a disproportionate impact in our community as we have throughout the past? And so the key thought, if you remember nothing else today, let it be this. No one is too far gone for God to reclaim. No one is too far gone for God to reclaim. A few months ago, I, I shared with you a little story that I said I was going to come back to during this series. It's the story of a woman by the name of E. Faith Stewart. Now, in 2014, when our new general director of the Church of God, Jim Lyon, took the stage for the first time, he introduced E. Faith Stewart's story. And hers is one of amazing impact. Back in 1914, she traveled with some others to Katak, India to start a ministry called The Shelter, which would reclaim young girls and young women from the horrors of sex trafficking in Jesus' name. But before 1914, a little piece of Faith Stewart's story is that she was visiting Colorado, visiting Denver, and she was being wheeled in a wheelchair because she was dealing with what we would call tuberculosis, what they called consumption, being wheeled down the streets, and she came and passed by this little church in Denver. She heard them singing. She heard the joy in their voices like we heard you just moments ago, and she asked to be brought in. And for a very short season of her life, E. Faith Stewart became a part of that congregation. In fact, Jim Lyon shares that he believes it's the honest prayers of that congregation that allowed her to stand to her feet and never be bound to a wheelchair again. Faith Stewart went on to impact hundreds, maybe thousands of young girls' lives reclaiming their destiny from the gates of hell. And as I shared with you last time, the church in Denver that made that impact in her life was this church. That is a part of our history. For 103 years, we have been in this battle against sex trafficking. And now in this season, we are joining with our greater heritage in the church of God to make an even greater impact. A couple weeks ago, we had five of our members do the A21 silent walk against sex trafficking, the walk for freedom. It was an amazing experience. And as you heard Evie say, every first time guest card we receive every week, we give $5 to the battle against sex trafficking. But let me just ask you this. 
If our key thought is that no one is too far for God to reclaim, no one is too far gone, that God is unreasonably generous enough that he will save even the worst of us, what if that means we're not just called to impact the women and the young children who are in this sex trafficking industry? What if that means we are, reclaim, we are called to reclaim the rapists, sellers, and pimps as well? Would that bother us? Would that make us struggle? You see, today we're going to encounter in God's word the story of a woman who fits that bill as one of the people God misses most. Let me just give you a little side because you'll hear me use that phrase a lot. The people God misses most is a phrase I stole from one of my mentors and friends, Paul Strozier. And the moment he said it, I said, that is the greatest phrase I've heard towards that. Because usually we use the word the lost, right? But if you're one of the people who doesn't know Jesus and you say the lost, you're like, I'm not lost. I pretty much know where I'm going. But if you listen to the language of the people God misses most, you hear God's heart shining through it. Because it's not about, you know, if you're wandering or if you're not. It's about if you are standing near God or if you're out there away from him. Because each of us is God's children. And look, if you have two kids and one of them is standing at your side and one of them is lost in the woods, you don't love one kid more than the other, but you certainly think about the one that's lost, don't you? You certainly use your resources differently to reach the one who's lost. You, you manage your schedule differently to reach the one that's lost. It's not about loving one more than the other. It's about the people God misses most. And so we're going to come across Rahab's story. Turn, if you will, to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. Now Rahab, as you'll see in this, is a career prostitute. She's a, a pagan prostitute who is serving in the area of Jericho. And we're coming, uh, her story comes into Joshua's story. You see, Joshua followed Moses, the great leader of Israel, who was told that he was going to send the nations into the promised land. But God's people rebelled. And so a generation had to pass. And now Joshua, who's in the new generation, is being promised this land. And so we pick up the narrative in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove, saying, Go and scout the land, especially Jericho. So they left. And they came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now the king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab and said, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, for they have come to investigate the entire land. Verse 4, but the woman had taken and hidden them. We're going to keep going in a second, but, but let's just stop for a moment and kind of see what's going on here. So Jericho, which would be a small township, it, it would barely be, you know, what we see in these neighborhoods surrounding us. It, it's not a, a city in the way that we think of it today. And yet there's a king, there's a leader there who has gotten word that the people of God are coming there. They're going to reclaim the land. And he gets nervous. So what does he do? He hears that these men have gone to Rahab and he reaches out to her, expecting that as a king, a lowly prostitute would immediately obey any orders. But let's pick up in verse 8. It says, Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord your God has given you this land, and the terror of you has fallen on us, and everyone who lives in this land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart, and everyone's courage failed. Now, I want you to listen to this next phrase. For your Lord, I'm sorry, for the Lord, your God, is God in heaven and earth below. The Lord, your God, is God in heaven and on the earth below. You see, something was already going on in Rahab's heart. God had already started to move in her life. She was already questioning things. When she says, I have heard about this, she's not talking about recent events. This would have been over 40 years ago. This would have been stories that were passed down to her generation of what God had done. And now these Israelite men are coming to reclaim this land. 
How many of the people God misses most have heard about him? They've heard stories of his great name, but it's things that were done 40 years ago. It's things that were done in the past. How are we proclaiming his name in new ways to a new generation, letting them know that God is still relevant, still involved in their lives, and still wants to bring hope to each and every person? If you remember about eight weeks ago, we began this journey into our 130th anniversary by talking about the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, if you play any sport or if you watch any sport, a hall of fame is really like that elite echelon. Like you can get all the touchdowns that you want, but if you don't make the hall of fame, you have not made it. Your legacy may or may not be preserved. It's why those who have been disgraced and either been removed from hall of fames or not allowed into them are, are, are so broken over these things because that's what preserves the legacy. Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, we have a hall of faith of sorts, a hall of fame for the Israelites. And in that, we see stories of men and women that we've been going through over the last few weeks, Abraham, Noah, Abel, and more. But interestingly enough, only two women are mentioned in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Now, Sarah makes sense. She is the wife of the patriarch of the entire Hebrew faith, right? She, she, through her, the blessing of God blessed an entire nation and all of mankind. So Sarah, of course, makes it in. But do you know the other woman who is in that hall of faith is Rahab, the prostitute, the harlot, the pagan. Rahab's life was so redeemed, so changed by God, that not only is she listed not among the naughty list, She's listed in the hall of faith, but that doesn't just stop there. You see in James chapter two, verses 21 through 26, it, you see Rahab and Abraham compared together as an example of saving faith and how works should come out of it. So now she is listed as an example with Abraham, the patriarch of the Hebrew faith. But wait, there's more. Have you ever watched those commercials, right? It, it cleans, it does all this, but wait, there's more. Perhaps the greatest honor and the absolute most shocking thing about Rahab's life is that in Matthew chapter 1, in the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the Lord of Lords, the King of Heaven, is listed Rahab the prostitute. Can you think about that? God does not hide from us the fact that his genealogy, that Jesus' physical earthly genealogy includes a lowly prostitute. And if he can do that with her life and legacy, he can do that with ours. And so the first thing we see in Rahab's story is that God might redeem people even that make us uncomfortable. God might redeem people that make us feel uncomfortable. If you were sitting in Jericho during that day, you know, first of all, you'd be saying, the prostitute's never going to be the hero of the story, okay? That, that's just never going to work out that way. But then if you were to sit on the other side of that, if you read through the, the genealogy in Matthew for the first time and saw Rahab, you would go, whoa, 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 God. Aren't there better examples? Aren't there more important names you could have listed? And yet Rahab is there. Her story of redemption is proof that God is so unreasonable that no one is too far gone to experience his love in such a way that it doesn't just change their hearts, it changes the destiny of an entire people. That is the amazing God we serve. But let me get a little more personal with this. Let, let me bring in something that maybe will make it more modern to today. Over the last few weeks, we've experienced a very public figure fall from grace. As one of the most influential men in Hollywood, this man probably thought he was untouchable and was pretty sure that he was a god who was building a lasting empire. But as accusation after accusation after accusation, and they're still coming into this day, keep coming in, all of a sudden, this man's company has been dissolved. His legacy has been removed from the very academy that was supposed to uphold this legacy. In effect, he was removed from the Hall of Fame. His marriage has dissolved, and it's unlikely, but it's unsure at this point, that this man might spend the rest of his life in prison. 
But let me ask you this. What if his story isn't through? What if that's not the end of the tale? What if God were able to invade and reshape his story so much so that what is on the front page of the newspapers today, a hundred years from now, is not what's remembered, but the impact that he had as God changed his life? Would that make us uncomfortable? That's the story of Rahab. That's what it looks like when we say that no one is too far gone for God to reclaim them. Because there's something inside of us, and please, I'm not excusing this man's actions by any stretch. I'm not saying there shouldn't be repercussions for his actions. But let me just say this. Would it feel uncomfortable if 50 years from now we looked back and he was remembered as a hero because God changed his life? That is something we have to struggle with. Because as we look at Rahab's story, the second major thing I want you to see is that we must remember how God has unreasonably forgiven us. We must remember how God has unreasonably forgiven us. In your devotionals that, that you're going through right now for this series, there's a challenge, and the challenge is to post on social media and finish this phrase, before I turned my life over to Jesus, I was. Before I turned my life over to Jesus, I was. And you've heard some of my story. Before I turned my life over to Jesus, I was addicted to pornography, which is the gateway drug to the sex trafficking industry. Before I turned my life over to Jesus, I was a fatherless child. I didn't know if I had hope. I didn't know where to go to find hope. Before I turned my life over to Jesus, I sat at the bottom of a pool one morning and just said, what if I didn't come back up? And guys, I don't think my story is that shocking. I don't think it's that grand. To be honest, whenever someone said, can you share your testimony? I'm like, there's not really that much there to share. I was, you know, a pretty good kid. I never did drugs. I never did, you know, whatever. But the reality is every single one of us, as Romans says, has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has that Rahab story. It may not be murdering someone. It may not be that you are a prostitute. You may not be selling others for money but you have a piece of your story that has broken God's heart and broken that relationship with him and he has forgiven you unreasonably. And so the last thing then in her story we see is the call to arms for this week, the commitment that we have on the road ahead that we will join Jesus's mission of relationally reaching the people God misses most. Look, Rahab's story had a turning point. She already knew something about God but she didn't know God. She had heard stories about God, but she hadn't seen God. The crazy thing is in this text, we don't even really see how it is that she came to this faith that would lead her on to be in the hall of faith. But something about the interaction she had with God's people, something about the simple verses that are there, of how they challenged her, of how she worked with them, changed her destiny forever. And I believe that those people who are out there looking for Jesus or even just looking for hope, but they don't know where to find it, just need a relational interaction from us. I'm not talking about a, a token interaction where you say, hey, I checked that off my list today. I'm talking about a real interaction where we go back again and again. If we see them in the supermarket, they're checking us out. We intentionally go to their line, even if it's going to take us a little bit longer. We just give that extra little smile, that extra little word of peace to that person. You see, we've been given a mission by God. We are here to reclaim all that hell has stolen. We are here to help people find hope and help people live Jesus-centered lives. And that is spiritual warfare. It's a battle that we are going to have to walk into every single day. And that is where I want to transition and challenge us this morning as we enter into prayer. You know, every week, or every month that is, the last Sunday of the month, we do what's called elders prayer, where we have our board of elders come up, we, we have them stand up front, and we ask for whoever would like to be prayed over to come up front. You know, this week we had a conversation with someone who was talking about how we could, you know, maybe update some of the things in our sanctuary in our hallway. And, and she said something that Kellen and I just hadn't even thought of necessarily. She said, you know, having people come up front, if you just had an area in the back there, maybe more people would come forward. And I said, oh, wow, that is that's shocking. Just the, the simple thought. So whether you stay where you are, whether you come up front with the elders, what I would ask in this time 
is that we pray. I realize I didn't leave you with anything actionable today. I always try and give you something to do that it is a call to arms from the message. But when it comes to reaching the people God misses most, there's no two or three step program that's gonna make it happen. And anyone who tells you that is just simply looking at people as numbers and not as names. But there is one thing we can do together as a church, and that's pray. I've talked to several people this morning even who said, I am going through spiritual warfare. I am going through a battle. And I believe we as a church, as we transition in this season, as we reclaim who we have always been to reach who God is calling us to reach in this next season, are going through some spiritual warfare as well. And so my call to you this morning, whether you sit in that pew, whether you come forward, is pray for what you have on your heart. Pray for the people around you, but also pray for this church in this next season. As we enter into a season where we are called to reach the people who are sitting right here now and who have been here for 40 years, but also the people who are out there who don't know Jesus and don't know where to find hope. And so as the band plays, elders, if you would come forward for the elder prayer, and if you would join me at the altars or make an altar where you are, and let's just pray.